right, so welcome to another episode of Imagineering, where we try and help you move up in the world instead of just on with it. My wonderful guest today is Paul Traval, all the way from Amsterdam, and he's going to tell us a bit more about his value-to-profit model. Paul is an international human capital consultant. He travels around the world and helps companies become better employers to help engage with their employees and basically understand that the better your employees can work and the more happy your employees are, the more money they're going to make you. He's also currently serving as the president for the Global Speakers Federation, which is the unifying body that oversees, helps and develops all the associations around the world for professional speakers, trainers, to understand that it's not about competing for the same pie it's about making the pie bigger so it's not just you or me or this guy or that guy it's about all of us and we're all helping each other to be better and to be stronger and to help the world move up and not just on paul thank you so much for doing this and welcome to imagineering thank you for asking me to be on your show now i want to talk today about the value to profit model and i've heard you speak about this a few times and every time i i, I listen to it i seem to take away something else, something more. And I wanted to know what exactly is it that you define the value to profit model as and how did you come up with it? Yeah, well, the, the value to profit model, that, that's, that's more the scientific name of our model. Um, when I go on stage, I call it happiness makes money. Happiness uh, makes money. Because we, we understand immediately, immediately what it means. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's quite difficult. It's, if it's that easy as it sounds, everybody would do it. Yeah. But maybe that's the reason why I started speaking about it. Because I started as a lawyer in the Netherlands and I was an expert on sick leave, absenteeism. So a lot of companies asked me, oh, can you help us to reduce the number of sick leave? Um, we discussed already there is next to sick leave there is presenteeism as well I am present but I'm not really working that hard and most of the time people have great reasons for it because they have a sick child they don't feel well they are financially in big trouble and what you see is that production goes down and we all get it if your mind is somewhere else because you're in big trouble you can go to your work because you don't want to get fired, but still, are you really productive? Mm. No. Now, production is an average of 70% during daytime. So I, I see managers who say, oh, no, you need to be productive for 100%. Well, it that's doesn't that's, work. I don't think that's possible. Isn't that that's, just going to lead to burnout. That's a dream world. That's a dream so world, yeah. Keep on dreaming, but... 70% should be the average. So when you're there, 70% of your time, you should be productive. And what I see and what research has shown that sick leave, when that's 1% point, presenteeism will be up to 2, 2.5%. So more than so double. It's more than double the sick leave that you register in your organization. But on the other hand, this is some sort of sick leave as well. I'm mentally not there. So I saw these numbers and in, in the Western world, sick leave is quite high. Um, and that's a luxury problem as well because people get money when they are ill. They, they, so you can still survive in the Western world. But on the other hand, only 1.5% sick leave is normal. That's medically proven that you can't prevent it. So 1.5, let's say 2% of the sick leave is normal. All above is something else. Um, then I, I came up to um, research done by Gallup. Gallup is an American consultancy company working worldwide, doing research worldwide. Is it all scientifically proven? We're not sure, but it helps to set the standard. Uh, if you research it in 140 countries, well, then you have some idea about mm. the truth, about reality. So, and they say that 
part of presenteeism and sick leave is connected to engagement or disengagement. And that's what I love, because the more people are engaged, the better they perform. Um, so sick leave goes down, the number of mistakes go down, and I always hope when I have to go to the emergency room in a hospital, that those people don't make mistakes. Yeah. So what we hope is not that they are suppressed to do the best job, but they are engaged to do the best job. They are happy to perform their work. Right. So it's not the who happiness stuff. It's the right. true, real, happy feeling that you have. I'm going to work because I have something to add. I'm, I'm there for a reason. And there, that's where we go wrong in a lot of companies. People go there to earn money, mm. not to add value. So the more value you put in, in your work, the better the results are. The profitability goes up. And profitability is much more than just money. So happiness makes money. It's the easy version. Value to profit means if you are adding value to a company, the profitability for you and your company goes up. And when I found that out, uh, then I looked at research done by some Dutch professors. Uh, Arnold Bakker is one of them. He made the job demands resources model. Uh, okay. And, and in that model, they say, well, you have your energy resources. That can be your personal life. When you have a nice personal life, you have family, you have friends, you have a house, you, you have food, you have enough to drink, then that's a resource for you. It gives you energy. Mm. On the other hand, when you have a job that gives you energy as well, so it adds value to you, then those two resources can become bigger and bigger and bigger. They influence each other. And then on the other hand, we have job demands. When you go to work, you, you know it will take energy from you. Because, because you have to work with a lot of people, you have uh, limits in your time, you have a deadline in your work, you have colleagues who aren't that nice, so it will take away energy and then it depends on do you have more energy getting or is it going down so burnt out means that all the energy you get from your work and your personal life goes up in the job demands so at the end of the day your battery is completely empty and you can't refill it during night time because you're not quiet anymore. You're not resting anymore. Your, right. your brain is still going on the whole night. So you're stressed. And when you're stressed, you lose energy instead of gaining energy. That's the main in, in the, the uh, value to profit model. And what I found out is that it has to do with your own core values. So it's not your boss who's only responsible. It has to do with you as a human being yourself. So if you don't like your job, why are you still there? Why are you still doing it? Yeah, because of well, the money. Yeah, because, and, and let's be honest, a lot of people don't have that obvious choice mm. to leave and, and work somewhere else. So it would be too easy to say, hey, employee, it's your problem. I think some employers do it. They say, hey, that's your problem. If you mm -hmm. want to leave, please leave. Just go ahead. The thing is that in the current world, the number of employees is reducing. So in, in the Western world, even in Europe, the US, Australia, New Zealand, the number of people that are qualified to do a job are getting less and less. So, immigration is not a problem, it's an issue because we need the people to 
work in schools, to be nurses, to take care of elderly people, because we don't have enough of them. Mm. And then suddenly, the alignment between core values of the company on one hand and your own core values become very important. Because if I like my work, if the core values in the organization is aligned, then productivity goes up, sick leave goes down, so we have less problem in the organization. So it has to do with culture. It has to do with core values. It, and I love to call them non-negotiables because then we understand it much better. Yeah. If, these are the things you, you do not negotiate on. Your core principles, these are the things that you say, this is the line, I will not cross it. Yeah. Isn't that amazing if you are aware of those core mm. values that you can say, but hey, this is who I am. This is the true me. I can't do anything that hurts my own core values and I'm not going to negotiate about it. And then again, there are a lot of people in countries that don't have that choice. Mm. So I'm not going to say it's easy, it's everywhere the same, because that would be silly. That's yeah. neglecting the truth. On the other hand, we can still work with people to find out what their core values are and then help them to find the job or the company they can be of true value. Because they will feel much happier if they do the work they like to do. Right. I found this as well when I speak to corporates and uh, especially banks, when you have the people in the wrong position, uh, you've got people that are more introverted and they love doing the numbers and stuff like that. And then you send them out to do sales and stuff like that. And it just, it doesn't align who they actually are. And so then they don't want to do their job. They don't want to be there because it's not who they are. But if you can yeah. redefine or just um, reshuffle them, and we actually did this with one of the banks here, uh, where I told them, it's like, first of all, understand who your people are, right? Because if yeah. you don't know who your people are, you're not gonna, you're gonna waste them because they are yeah. valuable resources. They are people first and resources second, right? Understand yeah. the people first. And once you did the, the uh, we did the NBI, the Near Flying Brain Instruments with them, and when she could understand where they would eat fit personally, she put them in those positions. And, they didn't each excel uh, just better, but they were more engaged. They actually loved coming to work. They loved doing what they were doing. And so the entire company just went up. And I thought, it's just, it's so awesome because this is exactly what Paul's been telling everyone all along. You know, it's like if your people are happy and they are engaged and you as an employer understand that, your people will make you money. You know, your people yeah. will drive your company forward and be better. But as soon yeah. as you, you don't understand that they are people first, right? Yeah. They're just resources, just pieces on a chessboard for you to move. Then you're going to lose the game. Yeah. Well, that, 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 it's good that you say it because Gallup did some um, international research for the last 30 years. And they just published a book and it said it's all about the manager. Mm. So they're saying, if, if people come to your company, like you say, and they find a job they like, love to do, um, but you change that job and you let them do something else and mm. you see them not as human beings, but human resources. The yes. fun part is we can change the world yeah. HR, human resources, into human relations. So the business human relations. I love that. So you are a human relation manager instead of a human resources manager. Isn't that fun? Then your business fun. card, it's still the same. You're, you're still in the same department. You don't need to change. But instead of talking about, oh, that's, he's a resource. You said, no, I have to take care of the human relation. And then people become important. Even the lady who's cleaning the desk. And I think we should have those people during work time in the office, not after work time, what, what we normally do. So we put them aside and said, the oh, unseen, you have to 
unheard, you know, you're not valuable enough to be seen during the daytime. Yeah, and we complain when there is still a coffee cup on the table and we say, ah, that's not good. She, she should have put it away instead of what can I do? So we create human relations and this is a, a basic example how we can change our culture. So what we do now is we do a culture risk analysis within companies to see why is sick leave high? Why is presenteeism high? Why isn't there enough alignment between the core values? And we look into the culture. Oh, and I can tell you, we can measure it until the base floor. We, we, we can find it out. And it helps people to understand how to change. Because people say, we can't change culture. Well, we can. We can change culture. It's it, not that easy. It's not easy. Can. It takes time, but it takes leadership, I think. Yeah. It, it, it needs someone who is an owner who says, okay, I want to work with it and then find out what's going on. Right. So why are people not feeling well? Why do they do the things they do? So we, what we find out in, in the culture risk analysis is these are the core values that the CEO and the management team talks about. Then we research what the employees think the core values are in real life within the company. And then we measure up how much they can fill in those core values. Right. So you see on the one hand, that's the stuff we publish on the internet. And we say, hey, these are our company core values. And on the other hand, we see what the employees think the core values should be and how much are reached. And then you see, okay, we have a problem. Mm. And we can do it until team level. So we know exactly within which team what is going on. We can say, oh, dear manager, you're having a trouble. They did a problem, you need to work on it because this is giving you trouble all the way. And sometimes you see teams that are working that great because this is the core value, they need it up and sick leave is down, productivity is high. And you say, what are you doing that he or she isn't? And then we swap ideas. Yeah, but that's it. That's what creativity is all about. It's not just my idea or your idea. You know, I tell people creativity doesn't work in a bubble. It's not just like a balloon. It's just my balloon. You have to share ideas. You have to share experiences. And I was in a management course uh, two years ago. Uh, I thought it would help my job as a teacher to be part of a management course. And it took 12 months. And on the very first day, the, the, the facilitator asked us, what is your company's core values? The company that you work for, your own company more than half couldn't couldn't say they didn't know and they, then the next question was what are your core values and how does that actually fit into your corporation with the company to work for also no one knew and he said they already have a problem because how can you work for a company that you don't even understand yeah. and so we have to do these exercises about first finding out what a company's core values are and not just like the synergy, creativity, but actually understand it. Not just yeah. it, but understand it. And then we had to write our own, on our own core values and see how we actually fit into the company. And I tell you that, that that 12 months, that management course really opened my eyes to a lot of things. And this, this a lot of times, I think there's a Sun Tzu quote that says, uh, know yourself and know your enemy and you don't need to fear the outcome of the battles or something like that. And that's so true because if you don't know who you are and if you don't know why you're doing something or, yeah. or going up against, you're going to lose 99.9% .9 of the time. And yeah. I was in the Cape a few months ago uh, at Cape Town University. And uh, during one of the speeches, one, one young lady said, she wants to become a new kind of CEO. 
She doesn't just want to be the chief executive officer, which is all about me, me, me. She wants to become a chief empowerment officer. And I thought that's brilliant. You know, yeah. it's not about her. It's about how much value she can add to the company. And everything just comes back to the happiness makes you money, the value to profit model. And I keep thinking about Paul and his speeches and, you know, it's like, and he changed my life, man. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, you, you were open to another form of creativity mm. and then you can use it because you understand it, you feel it. And I think, it's so important. And of course we have science behind it and we have tools behind it, but I love to tell the story and I will do this afternoon for Russian speakers. Um, because I love the idea that every human being has core values. Yes. But we didn't look for it because we weren't trained or told that right. we have, them. and of course we have them. Yes, yeah. I always say it's somewhere in your belly. It's someone told me long ago that it, when we became from fishes, we went into the transfer transference to become human being. Part of our brains stayed in our bellies. <laughs> our intuition. It's it's our intuition. All people, when you ask. What is it? They say, it's my gut feeling. It's my gut feeling, yeah. It's, it's here, in your belly. Yeah. So maybe it's true that we, we think we need to do it here, mm. and there is something else that tells us, ah, 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 ah. don't do it, that's not good, but still the mind. And in companies, we try to work only with the mind. And rationalize it and make it strong and and all the nice word like agile and all the stuff i love it as long as used to creativity mm. when it's used to make something slim and easy uh, it's not going to work because the tighter we make it the more problems are within yes there is no space for creativity anymore we, because we reduce all the time, and you see it all the time, when people say in the bank, you need to do this work within five minutes. We make more mistakes. Yeah. Because others told us how we should use our brains. It can't. So, of course you need forms to fill out, but the way you do it, that's you. And of course you can't use two hours when it only needs 15 minutes as max. Yeah. I get it. It's, there is some production time, but we take away all the creativity from people and we're making them numbers instead of human beings. Right. And I, I think we're in a change. We're changing our vision about human beings and that's good. And, as long as you and I can work on it, I, I love it because that's, that's the fun part of it. And what you said about, you know, employee engagement and all kinds of things. Um, you know, Dr. Irina Yashin Shaw uh, from Australia, right? And she speaks on entrepreneurship, something I never actually heard of until I heard her speak about it. And it's so true. We, we want people to be, to take ownership of, of the company as well, because it's not the, I want them to feel like it's their company too, which means they, they want to be there. They want to work on new things. But if you're making them numbers, if you're confining them so much that they can't do anything and it's all just hate, you know, just, uh, uh, it's like in the beginning you used to, the, the, you can't have a hundred percent productivity a hundred percent of the time, right? It's like a car, even though it can go to 40 kilometers an hour, doesn't mean you should, doesn't mean you should go, and especially not for that long, because yeah. you, you will you'll break the car, you know, and the human yeah. being works the same way. You can't go 100%, 100% of the time. You can go 100% yeah. some of the time, right? Especially when it's crunch time or something like that. But you cannot, it's not reasonable to expect a human being to operate for that distance, for that pressure. Because like I said, that's how you actually break a human being and that's how you burn yeah. them out, you know? And 
then they come to work and they they day, but they not day. You know, it's uh, then they might as well not be there. Well, that that that's the fun part. That more and more brain research shows us that when we work for two hours, we need to do nothing for at least 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. And, and when you see someone sitting in a chair and when you look in their eyes, the eyes are open, but they don't see. Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. Because then they wander off, they are just somewhere and then creativity comes in again. So if we are taking people to the, the, the max of their ability to work, like in a lot of factories we still do with picking stuff. Um, so in the, the warehouses of supermarkets, of Amazon, and we tell them you have to pick 2,000 packages within two hours. Sure. People will make mistakes. Yeah. If we give them those two hours and say, okay, you can have a break for 15 minutes and come back and restart, they will perform 100%. Mm. Because we give them the rest to do something else. So let them have a walk outside. Let them have to do something, not smoke a cigarette, of course, but like we did in the old days that we told someone, okay, um, I, I close by here, there is a car factory. They make the big trucks. Mm. And it's all, all dedicated. They have... As exactly they know how much minutes they have to do what they need to do but if they do it within that time schedule there is something in the air they climb up the stairs there is a little box where they can sit and just relax and then the next truck cam comes in they go down do their job so the quicker they do it the more free time they have. Yeah. What you saw when they started doing that, instead of saying you have 12 minutes and the next one comes 12 minutes, now they have 15 minutes and they see that the number goes back to 11. So they have four minutes to rest. Mm. And the number of mistakes and accidents go down. Yeah. It's giving people time to relax to become creative again to have their mind open again and we can do it everywhere mm. so i i love to do workshops and and i do workshops for seven hours yeah but i'm completely exhausted afterwards yeah i love doing it it me gives too. me energy but you know how it is yeah. then, then you need to and then I go for a walk for at least one and a half hour mm. to get back into normal life and become a human being again. Because yeah. it's stressful to be focused for such a long time. On the other hand, it's nice to do. Yeah. So it's hard work bad? No, of course not. But we need to be aware that we need resting time during the day to keep on going. And exactly. it has to do with engagement. Yeah. Me and Rowan, we do a power series and um, we do like three sessions of four hours each or something like that, you know, and one day we did that. We did the three sessions all in one day. And I mean, I loved every second of it. But after that day, I said, never, ever, ever again do I want three sessions back to back on one day. And yeah. because I, I love doing it, but you can't go 100%, 100% of the time. And it's important to know this, but there are companies that allow the employees um, time to work on other projects that's not company related. I think yeah. Google is one of them. You know, it's like yeah. you can do whatever you want, right? Work on any other project you want because yeah. they know that by engaging your mind in something else, uh, you come back with fresh ideas and fresh eyes and all kinds of things to, to, to generate better results for your company. And, some days somebody might come up with something that's truly unique or, or innovative or what. And I say, Hey, you know, it's like, let me bring this to the company that allows me to do these things. You know, uh, that's what employee engagement is all about. It's understanding that they are human people, you know, and yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's what I love about Minsberg 
who created structures in five and we had to structure organizations and and finally when he became old he said oh my goodness i'm i'm not a human resource i'm a human being yeah and i he he said it 15 years ago and i was in a, at a convention in the netherlands when where he was telling a story it was one of the last times he showed up and he told it and i thought this is the key issue mm -hmm. we we talk and, and you you were talking about the ceo and chief empowering lady yeah this is normal to structure ceo on top yeah and then we go down and the professionals are at the bottom right the ones who really do the work yeah. are at the bottom so they're not important and Mintberg said it should be this you have hercules here the ceo who is supporting uh, the whole company yeah he's not in charge he is the chief supporter he is the chief empowering officer he is helping those professionals who are really in contact with the clients to do their work in a proper way yeah and that's a different approach and 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 you see a lot of companies who want to do it but i still i'm happy that still a lot of companies do it the other way around because then we can have this kind of chats yeah and, and earn some money as well oh. uh, <laughs> But it has to do. It has to do with how do you look at the role of leadership or management, and do you think the professionals are important, or you as a facilitator? Right. That's the question. And uh, as part, I'm part of Toastmasters International, and the core thing about Toastmasters is that the leaders are the least important. Right, because the members are the most important. Because without members, we have no organization. Our core mandate is to help the, the members become better speakers, better better leaders, and you know that increases your your uh, level of understanding and and all kinds yeah. of things. But and I thought to myself, I actually had this conversation on a car trip in Pretoria with uh, with another postmaster, and I said politicians do it wrong. It's all about me, 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 right? Rather than it's all about the citizens, the people who are actually important. And I, I use this now all the time. I said, stop looking to politicians to solve your problems, right? Yeah. Work together, create something by um, using self-leadership or whatever you want to call it. And if you can solve a problem, even on a small scale, do it yourself. Yeah. Get other people involved, right? Like, I started a food is free project here in Swakopmund a few years ago where a teacher came to me and he said, you know, it's like, I've got this problem about uh, the children. They, they have to come to school and they have nothing to eat. And then they have to go throughout the entire day with no food. And then they have to go home and they have to sleep hungry. And how am I as a teacher supposed to teach these children, you know, physics and math and biology and all kinds of things if they've had nothing to eat? A hungry mind is not a, a, a mind that you can educate. And I ask him, what have you done about this? It's like, well, I've written to the, I've written to the mayor. I've written to these people. It's like, but what have you done about it? You know, it's like, and he said, what can I do? I'm just a teacher. And I said, well, let's start by asking the better questions than that. So what I did was I bought a $14 uh, pack of seeds and I started growing some fruits. Uh, in my own garden at home and then we started transplanting them and then it just grew and it grew and grew and right now that 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 project feeds children on a regular basis and other people have adopted the same thing but if we expect the the mayor or someone else they're all playing a game called politics right it's if you can't show them that they're going to score brownie points for this they're probably not going to do it uh, but but that shouldn't stop you from, from empowering yourself and finding a purpose and seeing what are your core values yeah. and what can you actually do with these things. So I think this is all such valuable educational material. And I just wish more companies would, would engage someone like Paul Traval, you know, to, to help them understand that the person on top, the CEO, should be down here. 
Yeah. Right? Supporting everyone else because that is yeah. what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, that's always the fun part when you go back to the Greek and read their stories. Uh, Hercules was really forced by his father to right. carry the weight of the world. Yeah. Well, he's the CEO. Yeah. He's, he's not a god. He's the one who is supporting the world. And if a CEO says, I'm the most important person in the company and I earn most of the money, that, that, that's fine with me. As long as he still supports the professionals. And I had a talk with a company in, in Namibia as well a couple of months ago. And they said, yeah, nice story, Paul, but people are coming hungry to our company and work here. And I said, well, then you should start feeding them. Yeah. And it's that it costs a lot of money. Of course, I get it. But on the other end, if you don't support them, they will make mistakes. So it costs costs a lot more money. It costs more. So it's like you said, how can we help? Mm. How can we combine the first world with the third world and let them work together in a decent way? Mm. That's about listening to the people and just asking them, what can I do for you? And that's the question a CEO should ask instead of telling them what they should do. Because that's the wrong way. And of course you need CEOs because you need politicians. I, I don't mind as long as they serve. And one of the biggest things as, as president of the Global Speakers Federation, my job is to serve. Mm. The fun part is that people look differently to me now than they did two months ago when I was just the president elect. Now I'm the world president. And for some people that's different. I didn't change their perspective. Right. I'm, I'm just serving. A lot of people, like you said, look to politicians to say, hey, they should take care of me now. No, it's your responsibility to do what you need to do. And of course, you can ask someone in the hierarchy or someone who's your leader to help you and support you. But I think it's your responsibility as a human being as well, from your core values, to ask for support. Yeah. Not only tell the leaders, you should help me, because that's too easy. And I see it all the time on news, blah, blah, blah. And then people say, yeah, but they are the leaders. They should save us. And like you said, ask the right question to that person and say, and what can you do about it? Yeah. How, how can you help? What, what is your role? What are your core values? What do you stand for? Yeah. And I think we, we need to go back to that culture, that tribe, that we say we're here to help each other. Mm. And that, that would be nice. And if we have tribes with the same core values, or at least respect the core values of someone else, that would help and that would support us all. But you know, one of the wonderful things about the, the project, the Food is Free project was that uh, it didn't matter what tribe these children came from. It didn't matter that I was some white guy or whatever, you know, that, that wasn't even born in this country. Uh, they all just picked up something and started working together. And even though under normal circumstances, they would never even talk to each other. It was about the purpose, you know, and they enjoyed it and they laughed and they told jokes and it was so amazing. And I learned so much from them, just just being there, just experiencing it. But if I was... Yeah, Sorry, yes. You, create, you created a new tribe. Yes, exactly. With a shared purpose. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. And, it, and I thought to myself, this uh, corporates need to understand that they are creating a new culture. That doesn't mean that you ignore or, or disvalue the cultures that, that they have, right? But there must be a new culture and you need to feed and grow and develop and educate that culture. But if you don't do anything like that, and if you, like me, I would say that uh, a, a rake, you know, with the teeth, 
and if you rake uh, uh, a ground, you know that's the that's the only way to do it. And then this child comes to me and he says, "Turn it around," and it's like, "Turn the rake around." Why would I do that? The teeth are in this side, you know. It's like that's the purpose of the thing. It's like, no, it's easier the other way. And so I turn the thing around, and it's like <laughs> it's easier. I never thought of that. But if I would do this value him because he's grew up in a farm or something like that, you know, I've got textbooks about uh, agriculture and all kinds of things. I never would have understood that everybody brings something to the table. Absolutely. And, and, and like you said, you need to create a new culture. I agree. But you can only do it, like you said, to listen to everybody who has something in their minds. They can bring it forward and then you grow something new. And that's what you can do with companies. I, I don't blame them for whatever situation they're in now because that's history. Right, what just never be about blame. No, it's, it's about creating a new situation, listening to people, listening to the employees who say, hey, what are your core values and what do you think the most important core value is within this company? And then rate it through all the people. And you are amazed how creative people are and how they can help and support. And then I'm a happy man. Absolutely. I think there's something called uh, a just culture that airplane companies and I think train companies use as well. That if something goes wrong, it's never about blame. No. Uh, a lot of companies go, it's like, who's to blame for this right now? And then, you know, we, we fire them and it's like, that's it. But if people are so afraid that if they make mistakes, that the moment they make a mistake, they're out. They, yeah. they, they, they're not going to be enjoying any sort of experience. I've seen people hide the mistakes by, by eating a piece of paper, right? Um, they're so afraid of making a mistake, they would physically become ill if they made a mistake. But if you have a just culture and you don't start with blame, by saying, look, what happened? I can do something with some information, but if I have a culture where everybody's, um, it's not a culture, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the look at me CEO type of thing. It just, it doesn't work. And I think that's why we have to have a, 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 a discussion on, on how happiness can make you money. Yep, yep. Well, I, I totally agree. And, and, and of course, I, I hear some people and especially coaches say, oh, there are no mistakes. There are only opportunity. Of course, there are mistakes. There are always and, mistakes. And, and sometimes it is mm, new situation. How are we going to deal with it? Because sometimes the old stuff, the way we did it, is not going to work anymore. Yeah. And then we need to change it. Like, that we don't have enough oil and gas in the world to go on living and we will spoil the whole world. Well, you can blame a lot of governments or you can say, like you said, how can I change it? Mm. And how can we proceed and change the world? And if that means that you need to fly to a country to help them out, well, that's part of the deal. It's part of the deal. Yep. Paul, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much for this discussion. I always find so much value in talking to you. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, um, leave a comment on what is your company like? Uh, what do you experience your culture like? And if you want to connect to Paul, please go to his website, uh, paultraval.com. And uh, you can learn more about uh, the value to profit model, the happiness makes money, and you can connect with Paul. And I'm absolutely certain that you'll be happy to start a discussion with you on, on identifying and perhaps helping you and your company deal with the situation at hand and become better and grow into a more profitable, more prosperous company. Paul, thank you so much. Have a wonderful well, day. You. And uh, I... I, I just know that your speech to the, to the, to the Russians will go, right? <laughs> <laughs> it will be different. It will be different. It will be nice. But different is good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's, this is Imagineering. Thank you, Paul Treval, and have a wonderful Thank day. You, See you.